Good afternoon, everyone. Now, today we are going to talk about glory. I'm not sure whether you like glory, but I guess the answer should be quite obvious. But more importantly, we need to ask, can we handle glory? I believe uh, everyone here, we are pursuing some kind of glory. You know, the glory of being successful, the glory of being beautiful, being popular, being wealthy, to have a lot of money to do what we want. We enjoy having or pursuing some kind of glory. But have we ever encountered the greatest glory? And are we interested to pursue the highest glory that only God himself possesses? So today we will talk about glory and we will see uh, what is the kind of glory that attracts Moses and how Moses, he himself, radiated the glory of God. And today uh, we are covering Exodus chapter 34 and we will start from verse 27, 28. Now Moses was there, and verse 28, Moses there was, Moses was where? The there is up on the mountain with the Lord for how, how long? For 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So this is a new set of the two stone tablets. And here it literally testifies to God's word that we read, a very familiar God's word that we read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, that says what? Men shall not live by bread alone. So literally, Moses didn't eat for 40 days, 40 nights. But men live by the word that comes from the mouth of God. And verse 29, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law, in his, in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. I don't know whether you find this amazing. And what is the unusual thing here? The unusual thing here is not only that Moses, his face glowed with radiance, but that it glowed after what? After Moses had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, normally how would you expect a person to look like after fasting, after not eating or drinking for a long time? You will likely expect the person to look very tired, uh, very shabby, very hungry. In other words, the person is not going to look, in the, look to be in a good shape. But here, the Bible tells us that Moses, what? Moses looked radiant. You know, so some people say, actually, we sisters, we can save some money from uh, going for some brightening facial. You just need to spend more time with the Lord, let His joy overflow in our heart, our mind, and He will show on our face. We will become radiant. So here, Moses demonstrated that when he had spent a long time with God, and even without eating and drinking, his face still looked radiant. Radiant. And from this short two few verses, we can sense what? We can sense something about Moses. And what is that? That Moses, he is humble and he has this sense of self-forgetfulness. Why? Because we read that Moses, he was not aware that his face was radiant. I mean, the glow on Moses' face is not just a little glow. But it was so obvious, the face was so shiny and bright that everyone could see obviously that Moses' face was glowing with radiance. But we may wonder, if it's so obvious, the radiance, why can't Moses see his own glow? I mean, why? Why do you think Moses cannot see his own glow? Of course, the most common answer and reason will be, surely we cannot see our face, right? We cannot see ourselves. Uh, and that is true, we cannot see ourselves. But the strange thing is, even though we cannot see ourselves, some people who are proud, uh, don't know why, when there's no glow on their face, they themselves seem to feel like you know, they are glowing, you know, they are uh, especially outstanding. So this is uh, what is applic applicable to some people who are proud. No glow, but they feel that they are very outstanding. But on the other hand, there are people who are humble, like Moses, who felt that there was nothing on their face. But then, glory had actually come upon their face. And so here, we also recognize that human self-perception are often not accurate. We either think too well of ourselves, or we think too lowly of ourselves. And another reason, so first reason why Moses didn't know that his face was radiant, because he cannot see his own face. Another reason why Moses didn't sense the radiance on his face is likely because of what? Because Moses had just seen the greatest glory any human being can ever see on earth, and that is the glory of God himself. Now, if you have seen something which is the brightest, 
how would you consider other lesser things as bright? You know, just now we sang the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. There's this lyric which I love a lot. I don't know whether you noticed as you were singing, it's in the chorus. You know, all the things on earth will become strangely dim in the light of the glory of God. Now, why is it strangely dim? Because by right, the things of the world should be attractive. They should be important. And they are indeed important. I'm not saying that money is not important, health is not important. I'm not saying family relationships are not important. They are important. But every time when I sing the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, uh, these lyrics touch me. Everything on earth seems strangely dim in the light of the glory of God. Because no matter how important certain things that we are clinging, clinging on to may appear to be, when we compare them to the glory of God, suddenly those things become not so important, not so precious, not so, uh, not so such a treasure anymore. And so here we see that Moses, having, saw, having seen the greatest and brightest glory ever, he couldn't detect the lesser glow on his own face. And so here we also recognize, how can we sub subdue and uh, make human pride subside? And that is when we see how great God is, we are able to put human pride to rest and we will silence all human boasting. And so, besides being absorbed in the glory of God, another reason why Moses, he didn't realize his radiant looking face is because uh, he's also preoccupied with something. Now, Moses, yes, he has seen the glory of God, but he's also very preoccupied with, with what? With the well-being of God's people. Moses' people, that he was so preoccupied. What was, what was Moses doing when he was with God? Yes, he's busy listening to God's instruction, receiving the word of God, but he's also very busy interceding for the welfare of God's people. And so because he's so busy praying, no, God, please accept us again. Please forgive the sins of your people. He was so busy praying for Israel that he has no bandwidth to think about how he looked. And so that's why we hear Timothy Keller, he ever said something about what is humility in the eyes of God, in the eyes of gospel. So what is humility? Timothy Keller, Keller ever said this, this is gospel humility. Blessed self-forgetfulness, not thinking less of myself, not feeling inferior, but simply thinking of myself less. So this is exactly what Moses is doing. He was not thinking about his own glory, his own welfare, but he's thinking about God. God's glory, how everyone else will look at God. And he's thinking about uh, the well-being, the destiny of God's people. And so you realize from the example of Moses, when do we radiate most? We radiate most when we think of ourselves less. In fact, sometimes, you know, you look at all those proud people who didn't even realize that they are being perceived as proud. They are so full of themselves. They think of themselves so much. And they think that they are very outstanding. But the more they show off themselves, in fact, people all the more think that they didn't radiate anything. People just find it very turned off. So when we, when we think of ourselves less and we think more of God and others, we actually radiate more. And so Moses didn't expect that his face will shine precisely because that's not what he has been praying for. I mean, if he's not praying for that, of course, he's not expecting that to happen. But he's more praying for God and his people. But we need to take a moment to reflect. You know, Moses, he was too preoccupied with praying for the well-being of God's people that he forget. He didn't even care about how he looks. But unlike Moses, you just reflect upon our prayer. Now, usually how do we pray to God? Usually we'll pray, God, please make my face shine. You know, help me stand out in front of everyone. Let everybody recognize my effort. You know, in the office, let my boss see how good I am giving promotion. I mean, I mean, of course, there's nothing wrong to seek promotion. But you know, some people, all they are preoccupied with is God, make me shine, make me stand out, make me re remarkable, make people give me honor and glory so that I can be seen and rec be recognized and I myself receive honor. And so maybe perhaps one reason why sometimes God hesitated to give certain people glory or make their face glow, that is because there is this likelihood of that person becoming proud. Because why? It really takes humility to bear the light and glory of God. Not many people to be frank. Not many people can handle honor and glory in the right way. 
But we see that Moses, he was humbled by the glory of God. And that should be the right and normal response. I mean, if you think about it, how can anyone still remain proud? You know, having seen someone million times better than themselves. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes we ourselves without a right benchmark, eh, we may still think we are not bad. Maybe we are not bad in speech, we are not bad in uh, writing, we are not bad uh, in terms of uh, music or whatever. Sometimes we think we are not bad in certain areas until one day we met someone who is thousand times better than us and then we realize there's really no reason why we should be proud of ourselves. So in the same way, when someone encountered the real supreme being, the real glory, the real brightness of God, how can that person still retain that posture of pride? And so that's why when we see that Moses, he truly come face to face with God and, his, and, and God's glory, he was humbled by that. And so the Bible also tells us the reason, not just the fact that Moses' face was radiant, but what did the Bible say? What was the reason for Moses' face to be radiant? The Bible gave us the reason in verse 29 just now because Verse 29 tells us Moses' face was radiant because what he, has, he had spoken with the Lord. And so that's the reason. Moses' radiance is due to his close contact with God. And so as we think deeper, it is just when we say, well, it's very unusual that Moses' face still glow after 40 days and 40 nights without food and water. But as we think deeper, it is not so unusual anymore. Why? Because God is light. And so naturally, if anyone spends a considerable amount of time with light, with God, he will be enlightened by God. And thus, this person will be able to reflect God's light to everywhere he, he goes. And that's why, you know, there's this, there's this chain reaction. God shines on his believer. And then we believers can in turn shine in the world in our environment, to whoever we come across. And that's why Jesus told us this very uh, famous instruction, right? And Jesus said, and just now we read in responsive reading, Jesus said, who are we? Jesus said, you are, we are the light of the world. Not that we are light in and of ourselves, but because we have seen the light and we should therefore shine God's light around us. But then you ask, okay, so God says we are the light of the world. So how are we going to really live as the light of the world. How do, we, how do we carry out Jesus' instructions that we are the light of the world? The Bible, the passage today, gives us a very simple first step. Now, you, some people find it very overwhelming oh, and they may be, maybe they will find it laughable. How can we be the light of the world? We are just nobody or our behavior is not especially holy. So how can we, how can we be the light to the world? The first simple step as we can gather from today's passage is what? that we first need to have deep communion with God, just like Moses. Before we can even talk about shining the light around us, we must first get connected to the source of light. And of course, after seeing God's glory and receiving God's word, the next step, of course, we need to walk in the light as God is in the light. And so the thing we need to register today in our mind is we tend to become what we see. We tend to become what we see. So the thing is, you know, what we keep watching, keep reading, keep looking at, they will ultimately influence our thinking, our mannerism, and our behavior such that in the end, what happens? We become what we see. So you just test for yourself. Are you becoming more and more like what you always see? So I don't know what you have been always seeing, but the tendency is, Whenever we admire someone, whether it's a celebrity, whether it's someone uh, who is very noble, a role model, if we really like or admire someone, whether it's knowingly or unknowingly, we will somehow start to imitate the person, how the person speaks, how the person dress, uh, the style, what they prefer, even where they go. We all become what we try to imitate. And so if we have been keeping our gaze on the perfect example of Jesus Christ, you realize that Gradually, you become more and more like Christ, more and more forgiving like Him, more and more compassionate like Him, even more and more just like Him. A few weeks ago, we say that God is merciful, compassionate, but He's also just. So as we keep gazing our eyes and fixed on Jesus Christ, you realize that you know, we will 
will be transformed by God's glory. But on the other hand, if all we are doing, all we are looking at is just the worldly trends, uh, whatever the world is pursuing, whatever the world is chasing after, you realize that you will also become what you have been looking at. Just like a mere secular man on the street will we'll look no different from any non-believer on the street. And so here, the question we need to ask ourselves, it's not just reading about Moses' face. I mean, what has Moses' face got to do with us? We need to ask, ask ourselves, what have we been looking at? Who have we been looking at? And who have we been spending our time with, fellowshipping with? You know, Moses, as we read just now, he had spent 40 days and 40 nights without distraction up on the mountain with God. And that's why his face glowed. Of course, I'm not saying, oh, literally, we need to set aside 40 days, 40 nights. You know, some people say, now is the period of Lent. I mean, of course, the period of Lent, it, there's some beauty to remembering God. But it's not just about, oh, literally setting aside 40 days, 40 nights, fasting, praying, and not doing anything else. But the question we need to reflect is, do we spend enough quality time, deep communion with God such that people, when they look at us, they can tell that, oh, we have been having this intimate relationship with God. We have been reading His Word. We have been praying to Him. We have been allowing ourselves to be transformed by God's Holy Spirit. When people look at us, can they tell that this is happening to us? Or when people look at us, they just can smell this flesh, this taste of the world, this carnal interest, this interest and desire of the world in us when we talk, uh, in the things we do, in how we plan our time. And so we really need to ask ourselves important questions every time when we hear God's word. And the question to reflect today is also, do we desire that the glory of God be shown on our face? Or do we secretly desire for another kind of glory to shine on our face? You know, the glory of personal achievement. Some people, they like glory to be shown their, on their face, but they like the kind of glory to be, oh, I want everybody to know I have this personal achievement. I'm very well honored in my office. Uh, I'm very popular in my class. Uh, I'm very beautiful or whatever. We need to ask. Yes, we all desire glory. But what is the kind of glory that we desire? Is it the kind of glory that is resting on Moses' face? The glory of being with God, the glory that is reflected from God, or the glory that is a selfish kind of uh, personal interest kind of glory. And so here, the Bible tells us, Moses, his radiance come from close contact with God. And then the, the other thing we need to, ref, uh, we need to reflect and uh, examine is, so now, okay, Moses' face is radiant, but what does Moses' radiance signify? What does it tell? I mean, so what? So what if his face is shining? It just makes him more handsome. Uh, I mean, besides that, what is the point of his face being radiant? And so we have to understand when God allowed Moses' face to glow, what is the message that God is sending to the Israelites? I mean, just if you are to explain this passage, and if you were to think about, okay, why did God bother, not just to make Moses' face radiant, why did he even bother to record this down? Is it to, uh, is it to say that Moses is someone very special? So God, in, in allowing Moses' face to shine, he is first of all telling everyone that God, he is pleased with Moses. And he had, he had personally approved Moses to be the representative of God's people, Israel, to stand before God to speak on behalf of God's people. And so the glory on God's, the glory on Moses' face is in fact a prayer answer to, to Moses. And so don't be discouraged. When we pray the right things, God will answer our prayer. Remember what Mo Moses prayed to God before? And we said that it's a very daring prayer. Moses said to God, show me your glory. And so this is God's answer. God not just showed Moses his glory, God allowed his glory to rest upon Moses' face. And so, in other words, one of the things that God is doing not just, is not just saying that he's pleased with Moses, he is exhorting Moses in the eyes of all the Israelites. Remember the Israelites used to call this Moses what? This fellow, you know, before they make the golden calf. The, the people of Israel, they did not really respect Moses so much. They didn't want to submit to Moses' leadership so much. And so he said, this fellow Moses, we don't know what happened to him. But now with Moses' radiant face, God is telling Israel, you should listen 
to Moses' guidance and words because he is approved by God. He is chosen by God. But the more important thing here is not about exalting a person because we are not supposed to worship any human being, right? So when God exalted Moses, what is the most important reason? And that is, of course, God wants his people to exalt the words that Moses, his servant, spoke. Now, sometimes when God teaches us to respect pastors, preachers, cell group leaders, it's not because God wants to make these sinners or these humans extra special. But that's because when God exalted his servant, God's real intention is so that everyone will hold the words of God spoken by his servant in high regard. And so here, we see that uh, God did exactly, God sent that message when he made Moses' face uh, shine. And another important reason that relates to the people themselves concerning Moses' radiance. What does Moses' radiance also signify for the people? It's not just, oh, I, we have to take Moses' words seriously because they represent God's words. Another comforting implication that Moses' radiance can suggest to the people of Israel is when God allowed Moses' face to shine, that is a sign of God's acceptance also of, the Israel, uh, of, also of the people of Israel. It's not just that God accepts Moses alone. But re remember what is Moses' role? Moses' role now is he stands in the position of a mediator of Israel. So you just imagine, if the judge, if God, he accepts Moses as the mediator, means what? God will also naturally accept the prayer, the intercession that Moses made. And God, meaning to say, God will agree to what Moses pleaded for to forgive God's people, to shine his face on them again, to restore the relationship with, between him and uh, Israelites again. So the glow on Moses' face is in fact an encouragement for the people of Israel, that God still loves them, God still favours them. And so here, so it's not just about uh, Moses' face being very shiny. There's important implications behind. And so here, we, are, we only cover two verses. Um, we con continue reading the rest of the passage from verse 30. So now we have explained Moses' radiance. Now verse 30. So he came down. Huh? When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community, community came back to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all the commands the Lord has given him on Mount Sinai. Now here, verse 33. Okay, verse 31 says, Who came back to Moses? All the leaders of the community came to Moses. Everybody ran away. Wow, Moses' face is too scary. But verse 32 is important because at first Moses was with the leaders. But afterward, who came? All the Israelites came near to Moses, to hear his word. And what does this tell us? It tells us that everyone who belongs to God, even the lay persons like you and I, I mean, okay, uh, like all of you, not just um, the leaders of the church, not just uh, people who are caught into full-time service, need to hear and study the word of God well. Everyone who belongs to God need to study the word of God, need to understand the instructions of God well. So that's why at first, all the leaders came, but the Bible makes it a point to mention that all Israelites came near eventually to hear the, the commands of God. In verse 33, When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses put back the veil put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Now here, I don't know how many of you is very confused why these few lines are in the, in the Bible. I mean, why is this putting on the veil, taking away the veil, and why is all this relating to us, and why do we have to read this, and why is it important? So here, we need to understand, why did Moses sometimes veil or sometimes unveil his face? And we will observe certain scenarios, you know, at, during, on which occasion, during when will Moses veil his face and at which time will Moses unveil his face and for what purpose? Okay, so as we think through this, when did Moses unveil his face? As you read through the, the, the text, whenever he entered the Lord's presence. 
to speak with God, he removed the veil. So the times at, at which Moses unveiled himself is when he spoke to God. And why should he unveil himself when he spoke to God? Because how can anyone hide himself? I mean, two reasons. First is, how can anyone hide himself when we come before God? We, sh we should lay bare, lay bare ourselves. We should come clean with God. We should face God uprightly. There's nothing we should be hiding from God. And we also cannot hide from God, even if we want, even if we want to. Another thing is when you know, Moses was speaking to, uh, to God, he unveiled himself so that all the glory of God, as much as possible, can fall on him. He received all the light from God as much as possible. So when we come before God, we shouldn't have any barrier between us and God. There's no need to. And there couldn't, have, there couldn't be anything. Because even if we were to put a barrier, that is a false barrier. Because nothing can stop God from coming at us and knowing us. So Moses unveiled himself when he's before God. And another occasion where Moses unveiled himself, all the answers are there, so all you, you all know, know all, every, every, every point. But another occasion where Moses unveiled himself is what? When he spoke to God's people to pass on God's instruction. When he passed on God's command to God's people, he unveiled his face. To sh and why? To show them the glory that's shining on his face. And it's not just to show off, hey, see my face very radiant. But when Moses was speaking to the people of God, he unveiled his face, showed them the glory so that they can see that the word of God indeed carry weight, it indeed are honorable, indeed are authoritative. And God's word are indeed what they should take heed and try to obey as much as possible. And so the radiance of Moses' face affirmed the authority and the weight of God's word. And that's why whenever he speaks, so sometimes, you know, those of us who share God's word, we have to struggle with our, sometimes our lower self-esteem because we'll be thinking, eh, who are we to speak the honourable word of God? But we cannot hide the glory of God. Even though we may not be perfect when we speak the word of God, even when you are evangelizing, when you represent God to speak forth his word to anyone, we are to show them the glory of God without hiding. But then there are also times where Moses veiled, veiled his face. And here I list down the occasions. Moses covered his face for what? Moses covered his face sometimes, especially uh, during when? In normal times. Normal times means what? When he's not talking to God and when he's not passing the commands of God to his people. So, oh, suddenly I see my face, I'm very scared. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, okay, so when Moses, he's not talking to God and when he's not passing God's instruction to God's people, that was the time where he covered his face. Why? He did it out of love. Because if you recall what you read in the passage just now, people were afraid of Moses when he see Moses' face so shiny. And so, because Moses, he's not just a teacher, he's a shepherd. You know, he is there to lead and shepherd and minister to God's people. And if anyone has a shepherding heart, of course he wants to be near to his people, to God, right? I mean to God's people. If you are a shepherd and your people are very scared of you, then how do you minister to the people of God? And so Moses wanted to be approachable. And since people are afraid of his radiance, he covered his brightness so that his brightness will not hinder people from coming to him. And so from here, we also see and learn something, one, one important point, and that is, no matter how gifted, no matter how anointed, no matter how holy or spiritual a person is, if the person really loves God and man, this person, no matter how, how, how anointed, how gifted, he will, he will want to be approachable. He will not want to remain aloof and appear to be high and mighty and scare everybody away. A truly loving shepherd will make himself approachable to the people he's ministering to. But then, when we see that the Bible tells us people were afraid of Moses' radiant face, we also need to be prepared. Those of us, uh, those of us with the desire to, be, to pursue godliness, we need to be prepared in our heart as we read this passage. Why? Because it is indeed true that, you know, just like the Israelites, when they saw Moses' face so bright, they were so afraid, that reminds us that it may happen to us also because if we are too close to God, 
if we are too spiritual, too godly, too holy, you know, people will start to find us a bit uncomfortable. You know, people will say, hey, this holy guy comes already. Uh, this holy guy is coming with his holy talk. Or this holy guy is coming to invite us to church during Easter again or whatever. You know, people will start to feel a bit uncomfortable. So the, the point that we need to um, remember is even if it is true that it may make people uncomfortable, we must still imitate Christ and we must still shine the light of God wherever we go. Now, of course, I'm not saying we should purposely seek to be uh, weirdos or strange people in our, in our fields of living. Of course, we shouldn't purposely try to be funny or try to be odd, but we need to be prepared. It is inevitable that people will get a bit uncomfortable as we talk too much about God, as we spend too much in church, as we are very uh, set apart from the world, or as we center all our decision, all our life upon God. So, people may get uncomfortable, but what we can do is we try as much as possible to be like Moses, to be approachable. So when we are with people out of love, we veil our face, we try to be normal, but we also present the light of God so that they know, they can sense Christ in us. Oh, very fast, change already, okay. So, another, so this is one reason why Moses veiled his face out of love because he doesn't want people to run away from him. If people run away from us, how do we minister to them? Another reason why Moses veiled his face is as what we mentioned just now. Moses, he is a humble person. So naturally, he doesn't want to show off the glow of, on his face. And so that is Moses' response. He's humble. Even though there's this glory, he hides it sometimes. Uh, but I'm not sure, you know, can we say or can we respond in the same way? Now, just imagine, today, if the glory that is on Moses' face is on your face, wow, we also have this radiance on our, and this glow on our face. We just check our heart. When we receive this special glow on our face, will we be very eager to let everybody know how good and how outstanding we are? Or are we able to hide that? I don't know which one you find it harder to do. You find it harder not to show off or find it harder to show off. <laughs> you find it harder to let people know how good you are or don't let people know how good you are. I don't know. Sometimes, you know, sometimes when we have a good news, oh, we got a very good grades or we got promoted or we got a pay rise or whatever. We secretly hope that, how oh, I wish everybody can know, but I don't know how to pass the message around to tell people, you know. But, but for Moses, it's opposite. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to show off that glow. So we can see that, that's why I say, it takes, it's not easy to handle glory. It takes humility to handle glory. A humble person like Moses will not think that he is more superior than anyone else. I'm not just talking about earthly material achievement. Even if we have all the spiritual mysteries in, the, in, in heaven that we can understand, if we are a child of God, we will not feel, oh, we are more superior than other sinners. We will know we are as equal a sinner as other, other human beings. But the love from God, the justice of God, the righteousness, righteousness of God will flow through our life, but we will still remain humble if we truly know our place in the, in the eyes of God. And so Moses, why he veiled his face? Because of humility. And Moses' um, veiling and unveiling of his radiance reminds us also that, you know, when God honour his... I mean, God will surely honour his servant. You realise God will surely honour his servant, like God honoured Moses. So, for those of us here, if God, if you, if you see that God is honouring you right now, maybe you are serving him as a deacon, as a Sunday school teacher, as a, as a cell group leader, or even you are serving him on stage. Maybe one day you are called to read the Bible, or maybe you are doing support singing, or whatever. I mean, these are positions of limelight, positions of honour or glory. We can accept the glory that comes with this glorious mission, but we should never attribute the glory to our own worthiness, our own conditions, our own factors. But this glory is a result of the glorious mission, the, the glorious calling that God has put us to. So here, the Bible tells us humility uh, needs to be exhibited even after we receive the highest glory. 
And the Bible also tells us another reason why Moses veiled his face, and that is to prevent the Israelites from seeing the fading radiance. Okay, I'll explain a bit later when we read another passage. But just now we mentioned, the radiance of Moses' face signify what? Signify that God's word has authority. But later on, we'll read from another passage that Moses' radiance uh, will fade. That means when he first met God, spoke with God, the radiance is highest. The longer, as more days pass after his talking with God, the radiance on his face will be gone gradually. And Moses wanted to hide that fading radiance. And his intention is very good. Why? Because if the radiance on his face signifies how important God's word is, then the opposite is true. If the, if the Israelites were to see that, hey, how come Moses' face ah, is getting less and less bright? They will have this idea, oh, perhaps God's word is getting less and less important. We don't have to be so bothered about God's word now. You know, so Moses doesn't, doesn't want the Israelites to belittle God's word and glory, and so he veiled himself. That's the third reason. And that leads us to the next point I'm going to mention, that is, the radiance on Moses' face, in fact, points us to a more glorious mediator because Moses' face, the radiance will fade, but the perfect mediator, his glory will never fade. In fact, when you think about the, the, transform, the transformed appearance of Moses, you know, his face becomes bright after encountering God. What does this remind you of? I mean, if those of you who are very well-versed in the Bible, and you read about, oh, Moses' face, Moses' appearance transformed by the glory of God. And if you are very familiar with the Bible, you will recall which incident? Jesus' transfiguration that we read about in the New Testament. Luke chapter 9 tells us similar things that happened to Jesus as what has happened to Moses. So Luke chapter 9 tells us, as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed. And his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Oh, so similar thing happened to Jesus. You no, know, Moses, his face also become bright. Here, Jesus also become bright. And even though Jesus' transfiguration sounds very gorgeous right now, this is only a glimpse of the full glory of Jesus that we will get to see when we meet Jesus face to face in future. And interestingly, if you notice or if you remember, during the account of Jesus' transfiguration, who was present there as well? Moses. Moses and Elijah appeared in the glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. So in fact, the account in Exodus that we read about Moses' face turning bright, it in fact points us to Jesus' transfiguration later on. And so Moses, as we have shared earlier in other chapters of Exodus, Moses is not the most perfect mediator. He is only pointing us to the ultimate glorious mediator and we know who is, who is he? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, there it explains even in greater clarity on Moses' glory and the veiling of his face. So look at, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We read it in the responsive reading just now. But let's take a look closer. Verse 6. He, and this he means God, God has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, letter meaning the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Verse 7, now, if the ministry that brought death, then what is the ministry that brought death? It's actually referring to the law. Because later on, as you read, this ministry that brought death was engraved in letters on stone. So this let, engraved on letters on stone refers to the Ten Commandments, to the, to the law that was engraved in the stone tablet, so if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of his glory, transitory though it was, will not the spirit, ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? And if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has, has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. Now, there's a lot of things. Uh, later, we will unpack this. Verse 11, And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face 
to what? So he explained the reason why he's covering his face. To prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. What was the end that's passing away? That means the, the fading radiance of the glory that was shown on Moses' face. And so here, Paul mentioned there's a difference uh, there's a difference between Moses' ministry and Paul's ministry. Paul said, just now verse 12, we are very bold because we are not, not like bold Moses. So Paul said he could be bold because he's ministering under the new and permanent, non-fading covenant. But Moses cannot be so bold because Moses is ministering under the old covenant whose glory will fade. And that's why Moses covered his face so that God's people will not see the fading glory and become shaken in their faith. In verse 14, but their minds, that means um, the Israelites' minds, were, were made dull, for to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. Old covenant meaning the law is read. You know, the Israelites, they have been, when they go to their so-called church, their synagogues, they were here, they were here, or they go to the temple, they will hear the law being read to them. So even today when the law is being read, the same veil remains. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read. So every time you hear when Moses is read, how do you read, how do you read Moses? Moses represents the law. So when, Moses, when the law is read, a veil covers their hearts. And so what Moses is really saying, uh, no, what Paul is really saying here is that Paul is hi highlighting that it is not really Moses' physical veil, uh, that, that piece of cloth that is blocking the glory of God from the Israelites. But Moses is highlighting that the real factor that is stopping people from seeing God's glory is what? It's the veil in their heart. In other words, it's, the, it's a spiritual veil. It's the hardness of the people's mind and heart that caused them, that caused them to be unable to see God's glory. And so, remember... Just now we mentioned, when did Moses unveil himself? When he's speaking to the people, uh, God's word, right? But the strange thing is by right. So, so, so by right, uh, when people read the word of God, should there be veil or no veil? There shouldn't be any veil. Because when Moses spoke to the Israelites, God's word, there is no veil. But now, when the Israelites themselves read the word of God, there is a veil. There shouldn't be a veil. So here, when the Bible in the New Testament says, oh, even in New Testament time, the Israelites, when they read the law, their eyes are veiled. What does that mean? It means that the Israelites, when they read the law, they couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't see the glory of God in God's law. That means they, can, they cannot see Jesus in the Old Covenant. Even though Jesus himself mentioned that all these scriptures were meant to testify for him, the promised Messiah. And so here, when the Jews, they, yes, they loved the old covenant, they loved the law, they kept reading the law. But the Jews didn't realize that the new covenant has already been inaugurated when Jesus came. And so they didn't realize that the old covenant, the purpose of the old covenant is what? I, just, I don't know whether you also know. The, the purpose of the old covenant is meant to lead everyone to turn to the new covenant, to believe in God, to see the need for Jesus. And so, there's a veil in the Israelites' eyes. They couldn't understand God's word. They couldn't see spiritual things. And their hearts were veiled to the gospel. Just now in responsive reading, we read, if anyone's heart is, those who are perishing, their hearts are veiled to the gospel. And it's not, and we cannot see the glory of God, not just because our human hearts are hardened, 2 Corinthians, just now we read in responsive reading, also mentioned the God of this age, referring to the devil, has also blinded our eyes so that we cannot see God's glory. But verse 16, it says, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So whoever turns to Jesus, the veil of unbelief, the veil of pride, the veil of stubbornness, the veil of hardness is removed. And our eyes can be opened, our minds renewed, and we can realize that, oh, in fact, all scriptures are pointing to the Messiah. All scriptures are leading us to believe in Jesus Christ. And verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Holy Spirit sets us free from sin, flesh, and the devil. 
and verse 18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. So we all, meaning our New Testament believers, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So like Moses, even like Paul, we can come before God with unveiled face and we can see the glory of God and let the glory of God reflect in our life. Let the glory of God transform us progressively. Uh, in ESV version, incre ever-increasing glory is translated as from one degree of glory to another, meaning we cannot be glorious overnight. I mean, we are all sinners after becoming Christian also. I mean, we are still sinners after becoming Christian. So our glory, our transformation is gradual. So we will, we will be transformed from one degree of glory to another gradually. Now here, we see that Moses' appearance was transformed by God when he encountered God. So likewise, we need, to, we need to expect that when we know God more, God's glory will transform how we look to the world, how we speak, how we live, how we act, the image we portray should be transformed as we get closer and closer to God. So just like I say, we need not be disheartened when the transformation didn't take place overnight. But the Bible tells us if what we have encountered is true glory, this glory will surely make us a bit more glorious every day, every week. But here, as we look at this Second Corinthians chapter, notice that this passage highlighted three key contrasts between the Old and New Covenant. Just now, as I mentioned, Moses' radiance is to point us to a more perfect, glorious mediator. So here, there's these three contrasts that the passage has highlight highlighted for us. So just now as you read, you, you may be very, finding it very confusing. There's this ministry that brought death. And this ministry that brought death was contrasted with what? The ministry of the Spirit. So ministry of the Spirit, but why, mini why ministry that brought death is contrasted to ministry of Spirit? Because Spirit brings life. And the ministry that brought condemnation is contrasted with ministry that brings righteousness. And the ministry that is transitory is contrasted with the ministry that lasts. And this, just want to highlight that the new covenant that Jesus is uh, representing is far more superior and better than the old covenant. And so here, okay, let's take a look. The ministry that brought death, this refers to the law, just like I mentioned. But does it mean that the law is not good? Nobody dare to say the law is not good. I, I, I hope nobody dare to say that God's law is not good. God's law is still good, holy, and we should obey. But what is the limitation of God's law? It's good, it's holy, it's right. But what is the limitation of God's law? It has no power to save. The law sets the standard for holiness, but it does not give anyone the power to fulfill the demands of the law. And that's why Romans chapter 8 tells us the, the law of God was weakened by the human flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. So it's not that the law was not good, but what weakens the law? Our human weak flesh. We cannot meet the requirement of the law. So the law was good, but it was weakened by human flesh. And when humans cannot meet the requirements of the, of the law, what happens? Now, when you, can, when you cannot meet the requirements of the law, means what? means you violated the law. And that means we sin. And the penalty of sin is death and condemnation. So that's why ministry that brought death and condemn, condemnation is all referring to the ministry of the law. Because when we cannot fulfill, can, cannot reach the standard of the law, it brings death, it brings condemnation. But the opposite is God's grace. The opposite to this is with the redemption of Christ, we who believe in Him, we receive eternal life. The Holy Spirit, Spirit now dwells in us to give us eternal life. And not just that, Jesus, as we all often mention, Jesus' righteousness is credited, imputed to us. And so, this is the stark opposite from the old covenant. And what is another difference? Unlike Moses' glory that will fade, Jesus' glory will never fade. Why? Because he is God himself. He is the source of glory himself. He will never fade. But then as, even though, you know, as we look at this table, people will say, wow, this old covenant doesn't look very good. It brings death. It brings condemnation. It is passing. 
But the Bible, despite this huge contrast between the Old and New Testament, uh, Old and New Covenant, the Bible makes it a point to say that the Old Covenant is what? The Old Covenant is glorious. Even this Old Covenant that brings death, that brings condemnation, that is passing, even this Old Testament, uh, Old Covenant is glorious. So how much more is the new? So again, we, we cannot say, oh, this, old, this law uh, brings all these um, troubles of uh, uh, death and condemnation, so we should ignore the law. No. But we need to understand that ultimately, it is not the law which saves sinners, but it is the mediator, Christ Jesus, who saves sinners. So here, what we want to understand is, we must, as we read God's word, we must pray that we, we do not be like the Jews who veil our eyes. You know, the Jews, uh, they keep reading all the, all the books of the law. They keep reading um, all the scriptures, but their eyes were veiled. They cannot see the mediator. They cannot see Jesus' glory. So again, we need to ask ourselves, are our eyes veiled even as we think we are very knowledgeable with the Word of God? Now, some of us, uh, especially in the English service, many of us, we grew up in church as young children. We go to Sunday school, uh, we memorize verses, but we need to ask ourselves, because the Jews are also very knowledgeable in the Word and the law of God, but we need to ask ourselves, are our, our eyes veiled when we read God's Word? Yes, we know a lot of Bible story. We can memorize a little bit of verses, and we have heard many, many sermons, and we may think we are very spiritual. We understand certain spiritual truth, but if after knowing all the Bible study, all the verses and all the sermons that we have heard, but it doesn't lead us to a need for Jesus Christ, a need to rely on Jesus Christ, a need to obey and submit to Jesus Christ, then it means that our eyes have been veiled. We've been reading, but we have been missing the point. Because God doesn't just give us the Bible story, the, the, the sermon, just for information. If we have accumulated so many biblical knowledge, so much spiritual knowledge and information, but at the end of the day, we do not need Jesus, we do not want to trust Jesus, we do not want to yield our life to Jesus, then our eyes have been veiled, even though we have a lot of information. And so here, the Israelites of the past, they depended a lot on Moses. Moses had to pray on their behalf. Moses had to speak to them on God's behalf. But today, we turn to a mediator that is even greater than Moses. Because Moses, I keep saying, Moses' radiance will fade. In fact, Moses, this person, died already. But Jesus, he died, but he also resurrected. And that's why we are celebrating Easter and Good Friday coming weekend. And Jesus died and Jesus resurrected to save us and his glory will never fade. Now, Moses, he still had to use the veil to, to hide God's glory. But Jesus, even if you give him one million veil, he, his glory cannot be concealed because his glory is overpowering. And so here after, here, after reading this passage, it's not just a historical account, but we need to pray that just as Moses' face shine after encountering God, we should restore the willingness that after we have seen the glory of God, after we have been in fellowship with God, we should shine brighter or lesser than Moses. Brighter than Moses. Ah, now, if you think Moses is a really very glorious some people say, some people, some Christians may think, I cannot even imagine myself shining same level as Moses. But in fact, if Jesus, our mediator, is even more glorious than Moses, by right, we should shine even brighter than Moses. When people see us, they should feel the presence of God. They should fear God. They should, when people hear our words, they should be turned to God. But perhaps we may feel that we are not there yet. But this is at least a prayer that we should keep praying. So, one hope that God has encouraged us is we will be transformed from one degree of glory to another as we keep pursuing God. So today, when we hear the word, we need to reflect, first of all, have we encountered God's glory? And are we in awe with the glory of God? Or are we more in awe with a glory of another kind, worldly success, worldly beauty, whatever? And the second thing is we need to ask, okay, so if we have encountered God's glory, are we transformed by the glory of God? just like Moses has been transformed by seeing God. Are we transformed to the extent that when people look at us, they can tell that we have deep and close fellowship with God? Or people can only sense that we are just like anyone on the street. We have a strong flavour of the word. We have a strong flavour of secularism. So this is one thing we need to ask and reflect, examine ourselves. Those of us who believe in Jesus, 
He says what of us? He says that you are the light of the world. Whether you like it or not, you are the light of the world. So may God help us truly encounter His glory and truly reflect His glory through our life. Shall we go to God in prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for showing us your glory. Even though we may not be able to appreciate your full glory because our hearts are many a times drawn to other lesser things, other attractive things of the world. But God, we pray that you open our eyes such that we are not deceived by transitory glory. We are not deceived by things that will pass away, the world and its desires will pass away. But God, we pray you open our eyes, you open our hearts to appreciate the highest glory that is in, that is in Christ. And God, we pray that as we encounter your light, uh, you can also help us to truly live as the light of the world so that uh, wherever we go, whoever we are in contact with, we are able to uh, shine your lights, shine your glory into their life. God, help us, especially we are um, going to celebrate Good Friday and Easter. And it's a, this is a, a very good opportunity for us to uh, preach the gospel, share the gospel. God, help us have the courage, give us the opportunity, and help us to have a life that is aligned with the gospel call that we have received. And I pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.